Okay. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Cody University's Fourth Space. And thank you so much for joining us for today's event, part one of Critical Materialities. Thanks for tuning in. Now, to help situate you, we are streaming to YouTube live from Forest Space, and we are located on unceded Indigenous lands here in Chichague, Montreal. And at Forest Space, we work with our university community to help mobilize knowledge by co-creating daily activities that examine research questions and projects in development here at the university. And we're running this event as a live stream meeting also. So if there are any comments or questions, please uh, put them in the, the chat or you could use your raised hand. Um, and for those of you in the space, of course, we're participating, but also if you have questions, raise your hand and we'll get a microphone to you there. And with that, it's very much my pleasure to hand it over to Associate Professor in Design and Computation Arts, but also Concordia University Research Chair in Critical Practices in Materials and Materiality, Alice Jerry. Alice, welcome. Uh, thank you, Doug. So hi, everyone. Thanks for your presence this afternoon. Uh, and thanks to everyone at Ford Space for uh, the amazing support uh, and the fantastic organization. Welcome to Critical Materiality uh, 2023 uh, public mediation event. So Critical Materiality is an advanced special topics uh, research studio course that opens up new perspective and develops joint methods between design and computation arts disciplines, both graduate and undergraduate. With an emphasis on material engagement, making and process, students develop object narratives, visuals and environments <clears throat> as, as, as artistic and public responses to social environmental topics. <clears throat> A large part of practice-based research uh, transpires in form and sensory perception. What happens when the studio and our materials move to public space here at Ford Space? How can design and computation art practices be communicated and experienced? How do we foster discussion in public settings? This public activity questions practice in relation to matter, materials, and materiality, objects, technologies, media, and techniques. Today, students will develop feedback loops between practical and theoretical ideas that were catalyzed in class during the semester. While the core approach is to cooperate, experiment, discuss, and reflect in the public arena, this event involves rethinking the relationships between making and communicating research creation. Today, we have Anna Noel, Astrid Yates, Elan ergas Lenet, Noah De Pelto, Sidney McManus, Florence Boucher, Cathy Nguyen, Arnaud Jalbert, Deepak Bat, Kelly Smith, and Elam Sadat Abati uh, that will present. Thanks for tuning in. I'd also like to welcome uh, Mauricio Martinucci, aka Tez, artist in residence at the Milieu Biolab, who will join the conversation today and tomorrow for uh, both sessions. So thanks for tuning in. Material potential is seldom fully realized. All too often, we make waste of objects that could be destined for more. We take advantage, but we fail to take care to listen to their needs. We work with them, but we fail to feel connected with the objects that inhabit our everyday lives. We recognize them as objects, but we fail to look at them as lively agents. Our culture of wasting, of estrangement from matter, relies on these failures. To improve this culture, we must learn to listen to the objects. We must relate to them beyond just using them. We must recognize their agency, but how can this be achieved? Can sensory attunement to matter unfold its complex network history? How do relationships with and between materials change when we take responsibility for the moments of material transition? Thanks for tuning in, um, asserts that by paying close visceral attention to the material transitions in an object's life cycles, we can foster greater material longevity and cherishment. The objects themselves can find subjectivity. They can build relationships with us as we do with them. They can tell us how they feel. So I will let uh, Noah introduce the schedule of the afternoon. Thank you, Alice. Um, we're going to start today with a short uh, sort of sensory attunement exercise wherein people are going to kind of be taken through various senses and um, hopefully bring themselves closer to the objects and uh, closer to the meaning that they can create. Um, next, we're going to have just a free roam that people can um, explore, familiarize themselves with the various displays available uh, before we arrive at individual presentations of each project from each artist. We're all going to speak for about 
five minutes or so, talk about process um, and what we were trying to accomplish with our projects. Finally, we're going to have a break of about 20 minutes um, and then a roundtable discussion where we're going to talk about the various um, themes that we that we focus on with this exhibition. We focus specifically on matter, transition, attunement, um, cherishing, and and a diversion. Thank you. Yeah. Um, and we and we um, are beginning with the sensory experience because we believe that attunement specifically provides a doorway into all of those other uh, themes that we're hoping to focus on. So what we're going to do now is an exercise in attunement. Thank you. And so our first experience will be auditory. And so we will be playing a short piece and you can just pay attention and be mindful to what you hear throughout this audio piece. It'll be about three or four minutes. Thank you.
Okay, so now that we've uh, met the materials through listening to them, um, we're going to invite you in a minute to meet the materials through feeling them. So we have a whole bunch of boxes over here, and we'll invite you to come up, reach inside, and leave the materials inside, but um, really try to, yeah, meet them, attune to them, feel their texture, their form, um, what surfaces do you feel, what temperatures do you feel, and once you've spent a moment meeting them, you can grab a pen and write a word to describe uh, your experience of touching the materials, what they feel like on top of the box. So welcome, go for it. Yeah. Yeah, so we just ask that um, if you guys want to, you can write a word down that you associate with um, the feeling of the object and you can write it on the paper in front. Wherever. Yeah, if I, uh, I would feel like it's completely Try not to write that. Really? 
<laughs> Without looking at it. Also, really. Yeah, not looking at it, not looking at it. <laughs> Can you write in the table here? Yeah, and it's worth taking. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. Like, oh, I'm picking up the pipe. <laughs> 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 I know. Oh, yeah, yeah. You should have invited me, but I was going to think of it. After a moment of
I kind of want to cut anyone off, but can I leave it? I'm going to wait for people to actually cut it off. Okay. Um, we are now going to reveal what is in the boxes. Um, should we lift them and then I'll. Um, please feel free to write a thought or a word about the objects. Try not to say what they are, but think about what does sight bring to the table. <laughs> <laughs> you you can write again. <laughs> can we ask questions? No, no, not not yet. Okay. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Anything. <laughs> <laughs> you know what it is. An expendable barrel. Right in there. The fact that I didn't even consider it. Yeah. I'm no. Someone made that group box or no? That's just, 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 yeah. just write, write what site great. So it is a group box. Yeah, it's just something yeah. to over. Yeah. <laughs> 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 Uh, 
capaz, capaz. No, they see that. They're like, don't, I don't want to see that. Yeah, kind of weird. I mean, you put your phone down. Just be very Oh, you want to do it? Yeah. Okay, cool. Yeah. No, no, I'm, I'm going to fall asleep. At the end, it would be nice because otherwise it kind of, you know, reveals all the design. Mm -hmm. So it would be nice because that's Okay, hello, everybody. Can we all come back to our table of objects? Okay, before um, figuring out where these belong and to who they belong to, um, we would just like to like reflect on what just happened of how sight informed your imagination or uh, how touch informed your imagination. Yeah, what was your experience just now? I, I personally noticed that I found I had a really easy time not doing the just naming what the object is through the first two. But as soon as I was like looking at things, finding ways of describing them beyond like, this is a mitten, this is a tape measure, um, became really, really hard. But I, I, 
I think it was interesting sort of um, uncovering the identity in that way. I found that um, when we were looking at them or just feeling them in the box, when people had already written something on the box, reading what was written, like influenced my perception of it. Like with this one, I saw um, what some people had written and it kind of made me think about it a certain way when I was touching it. I felt the same after they were revealed and like, little stories were starting to be built and how like yeah building off of other narratives um yeah I would say the same uh, I found that there is some specialness when we touch things uh with with consciousness uh, and then you know we we go on touching so many things during the day without even realizing it like uh Touching the books, the plastic caps, you know, the bottles, our clothes, but we don't really realize. But here it's like, oh, you know, these small things, they just bring so much into our senses. And that that's kind of a unique experience. Mm -hmm. just... Okay, so these objects are what we call the reps of our projects. So they all correlate to the different projects that you'll see around the room. Um, we're going to take them back to where they belong. And um, we'll take like 20 minutes to freely walk around the space. And now you can bring uh, this like sight and touch experience to some of the projects. There'll be um, notes um, with each project, whether it's touch friendly or not. Um, so yeah, just take this experience with you as you explore. And then we'll call you back to meet um, at Astrid's project in the next to the door um, in about 20 minutes or so. So yeah, enjoy taking a look and a feel. <laughs> <laughs> Is it? I'll just charge these bad boys for twenty minutes. belongs to a project or a project. Muted. <laughs>
tour with the apps the, the tour yeah. all right so thanks uh thanks oh. for those uh, fantastic projects it's really intriguing uh i i find it really interesting to see the sequence of activities going from the haptic the sensorial the visual the sound and then seeing the projects and trying to make association and so i'm really uh curious to to hear more about uh about those projects uh before we start with uh with astrid uh, i'd like to reintroduce you to tez who was not there in the beginning so uh tez is, uh, don't be sorry. Tez is a media artist coming from Amsterdam. is in residency at the Biolab uh, within the Media Institute right now. Uh, so he'll be there with us for uh, two days and we'll join the conversation. So without waiting more, uh, we will let Astrid present her project. Hello. Um, so this is my project uh, called Labor of Sentient Love. Um, so over this past summer, I came into um, uh, a lot of this sheet metal that I've been working with. Um, and basically, I am trying to create uh, furniture and functional objects uh, for the home that only use recuperated materials. Um, so as you can see, this is the raw material. And then here we have the finished product. This one's going to be a nightstand. And then here we have some multi-purpose objects, but um, generally they're just for incense. Um, and yeah, so I'm basically focusing on how we can redetermine or redefine our relationship with a material that uh, was once garbage. So this metal came from um a metal factory in the south shore of montreal uh and when it shut down um they were getting rid of all this material they were just throwing it out i don't know why um considering it was a metal factory you'd think that they would have the ability to reuse it but anyway it sat in a shed for a very long time and then ended up in my hands um and now i'm trying to honor it through um uh yeah like letting it um have its its uh its self and its um rust kind of shine through in the final product uh so instead of painting it to make it look new i'm trying to embrace um the rust and all the marks that it has accumulated throughout its life cycle um i used it for a separate project uh in the summer so that's why there are some lines here um, I had sandblasted it, um, which is the like grayish area here. And then um, it rusted over again throughout the summer. And then now um, I've sealed it. So hopefully the rust should stop. Unfortunately, um, I had to seal it with a, a chemical based product just to stop, just to make it um, like safe to use in the home. That's why this one you can't touch because the rust will transfer. Uh, but this one is safe to touch. Um, so yeah, sometimes you have to make some sacrifices when it comes to sustainability uh, for making things like safe. Um, but I think it's a small price to pay for, um, you know, getting to use this beautiful uh, repurposed material. Um, did did anyone have any questions to kind of lead me? Because some people had questions while I was just standing around, but I was wondering if anyone, no? I, I do. I always have. Okay. But I will let the, the, the class go first. Uh, That's okay. You don't need a okay. question. I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm curious because you um, you created that this kind of diptych um, and uh, you have one object that is, uh, well, that is 3D. You have another surface that is suspended. How do you envision this, the, the future of that surface? Do you want to keep it as a surface or work it out uh, 3D? No, yeah. So this is an in progress uh, piece. Um, it's going to be worked into another one of these. So since this is a nightstand, this is like the left side. And then I'm going to make the right side out of this. So this piece came from uh, a piece that was like identical in size um, to this one. So I'm going to use this one to make the other side. But I wanted to show it to you guys before I did that. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, if that's it, I think we can lead over to our nose project, um, which I will let you. Uh, hi, everyone.
Uh, so hi, everyone. Uh, my project was more about uh, find, finding a ways to uh, catalog these kind of textile scraps. So these often happen like when you're doing a project with textiles or uh, if any of you have worked with uh, fabrics uh, and uh, textiles in their work, you, you know, you always have these kind of awkwardly shaped, you know, you don't, they're too small to throw away, but too big to actually use to start a project. And uh, they often like sit around in a bin or in a bag. From from the people I've talked to, they some they have these kind of organize, organization bins by size, by color, by types. I kind of wanted to explore how we could uh, use kind of data collection a little bit to to catalog these and also to enable to share these. You know, create a platform to share it. So I kind of created this digital tape measure. Uh, maybe we can well, well, uh, well, you can come later and try it on. I'll be I'll be here to guide you, but. Uh, you want me to try it while you speak? Yeah, yeah you can come. Uh, With your, uh, so like uh, in the cooking, they do that. Yeah. <laughs> so the first thing you do, I can just do the first step. Uh, right now, I'm the only one who can log in, unfortunately. But uh, these these one have already been scanned, but we can take maybe a small one, like this square one. I love a square one. Yeah, it's easy <laughs> to do. Uh, so I, so I did this kind of digital measure tape where you have this kind of red dot that you can put on the extremities. Uh, yeah. And then you can just kind of draw the outline of your shape with that. And it's going to give you the measure as well at the same time. And, um, so that's, uh, that's enabling, enabling the, like someone to just quickly, you know, uh, scan their scraps and get the measurements and actually get the data to uh, to put it in a database. After, after that, you can take a picture. So we're trying to get as much information about the scraps while doing it. And then you can just uh, enter quick uh, quick information about it. And uh, so the goal for it is to be as quick as possible. So since they're scraps, you know, we, we, want, we don't want to spend too much time documenting it. So that was kind of the, 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 the challenge a little bit. And uh, it's still not perfect, but uh, it's a good start. And um, yeah, we're going to let Alice finish it. Sorry, Powerful. sorry. I don't know, no problem. So after that, you get an ID, so you can just ID it however you want. And uh, finally, we have this kind of platform where uh, we're going to be able to, uh, to see them. So these are all the ones that have already been scanned. So uh, as we can see, we can see the outline. You have information here. Uh, the picture is kind of weird, I'm sorry, but we have the note and everything. So, uh, and yeah, and uh, you can also filter though. So if you're looking for particular scraps in your collection, you can just use that. And uh, also you can, there's this kind of tool where you can see if a certain square will fit in the scrap. So if you want to just cut it up, to create a square, uh, that that's from my research. Something that would be it's, people said would be useful, so I tried to integrate that. So uh, yeah, that's pretty much uh, my project. Uh, thank you. I'm gonna I'm gonna pass the mic to Kathy so she can. Oh no, sorry, Anna. Anna. Thank you. And so if we move over here around this little table, this is my project, Lay Me in the Sawdust. So it is a process and critical exploration of pro the process of woodworking. And so taking a piece of wood, in this case that originated from a tree, and then being mindful of its entire use process through the kind of gathering of the material from the tree to then the carving and woodworking aspect, but then what to do with the scraps afterwards. And this is a problem that I found in my own woodworking practice over the past couple of years of making these beautiful objects, like in this case, this carved stick or this candle holder, but then having a lot of sawdust waste left over. And it's still a very valuable resource that was just going to waste in my, pro in my process. And so I wanted to find a way to repurpose it. And so we have bioplastics. These pieces are made partially using sawdust from the Concordia wood shop and then pro um, partially from wood scraps from the carving process of these sticks. And so it's the tree bark and then also the sawdust from the carving process. So these bioplastics are made from the sawdust along with gelatin and glycerin and water. And over the drying process, they turn into very 
sturdy objects. So yeah, I wanted to make sure that I could sustainably have a creative process and creative kind of practice that wouldn't continue to produce waste. And the material of wood is such an important material. It's been around for as long as humans have been around and we've been using it throughout culture and throughout history and throughout families. And so many of our families have woodworking pasts, including mine. And so how can I continue that tradition and continue that kind of beautiful craft, but then taking it into the future and taking it to new places from where it's been before. So I've used a lot of tools that my family has given me in this process. I have gained a lot of tools and a lot of knowledge and the entire process of care and of life has been integral to this. So the branches that are on the side of the table are from a tree in the valley near my house in Toronto. So it was a tree that I've passed for my entire life, but had never really spent time with. And so this October when I was home, I went there and just sat and looked at the surrounding environment, looked at the animals, looked at the paths of people beside, looked at the river that was beside. And then these branches had fallen. And so I brought them back to Montreal with me. And so here they are. I uh, partially in my home and then partially at the school here, I stripped off the tree bark and began the carving process. And then from that carving process with all of the waste, I started with my bioplastics. And of course, all of these are free to touch as well. That is the whole point that this is an interactive piece and in that you can of course see the process, but also feel, and you can look through the book. And something that was rather unexpected throughout this entire process was mold. And so you can see in this example here, uh, in this one, it was taken from sawdust from another project uh, this semester. And this piece here with this piece of burl was inlaid into the piece while it was drying. But then the life from the branch and the lichen transferred very nicely into the here. And so it's another example of how the life of this tree has gone from living in the environment to then in the hands of a designer and into objects to use, and then into new objects and a new material that has a lot of future potential. And then a material that can't really be used yet, but that's another step. And yeah, are there any current questions? I have, I have a question, but I wanna keep it for the round table. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. And I will pass it on to Kathy. Thank you. So um, my project is about journaling and it's called Dump Your Emotions. And since now we mostly use like digital devices to write our notes, uh, our thoughts and everything, I wanted to explore, uh, bring, like bring back the paper materials. So I wanted to um, explore the influence of different paper materials and how it impacts our writing experience and our emotional well-being. So my first approach for this project was to um, gather different paper materials that spoke out to me, like the texture or the color. And I wanted to prompt the community with different questions like, uh, if the paper was blue, it would be like, what makes you feel sad? Or what are your dreams? And um, so after that, I uh, gave the paper to my community, but I realized that this approach was a bit hard because uh, when I gave out the paper, it would take time for them to think and I couldn't collect enough um, thoughts. And also thought that it would be hard for them to express themselves if they know that I'm reading the the paper. So I took a second approach where uh, instead of me being inspired by the paper, I wanted the community to be inspired themselves with the paper. So I uh, displayed the paper on the table and they would pick like a paper that um, spoke out to them and about how they feel. And then they can write one or two sentences and put it in the appropriate box that I labeled like if they feel enjoyment, sadness, anger, or if they don't know how they feel. So that way I thought um, it explored more my research question, how different paper materials evoke different emotions. Thank you. 
Now I'll pass the mic to Sydney. Hello, hello. Um, my project, uh, titled Again Again, explores themes of attachment, the performativity of objects, collaborative creation, and body object relationships. Um, my initial re uh, research question for this work was asking if play could be a means of crafting care for discarded objects. Um, often care is something, caring for something means treating it very like preciously and letting it rest and um, so that I think of like a set of dinnerware, an object that is only used once in a while, living mostly as a life, its life as something to be looked at. Um, alternatively, I think care can exist through giving things attention, um, through bodied experiences with objects, we can bring them new lives, letting them become things outside of what we expect them to be. Um, yeah, and we can, uh, break their borders of their intended fu intended function, um, allowing them to be multifaceted objects. So uh, the objects here on the playing field um, all have one thing in common. They have been let go of because they no longer serve the needs of their previous companions. With these objects, I wanted to explore how they could discover new paths, how we could listen to them to create fictional designs in ambiguous forms. I facilitated workshops um, that prompted participants to explore objects through movement. Uh, we first started with observing them and then we held them. Uh, then I incorporated gestures of how our body can start to serve the object. And then in the, in the end, we created fictional designs. Um, and so today we have the uh, witch broom. <laughs> um, <laughs> or a seesaw. Uh, this is our rocket ship um, where we have our little buddies floating around. Um, it is also a canoe depending on its orientation. Over here we have the pirate ship um, where right now the bubbles are walking the plank. Um, this is our a potential A-frame home. Um, and this is a, a chair, classic design object. <laughs> um, so then I, from that research, I created a book of prompts that can go along uh, with the objects or can be used separately to allow others to uh, bring play and, and um, embodiment into their own practice. So uh, the books follow the, the steps of the workshop um, and you can take them and use them with objects that you're considering letting go of to see what other potentials that they have. Um, I think play can facilitate a lot of imagination and um, yeah, I think we cut off an, an object's life before they're, before they're ready. So um, that's what this project is about. So I encourage you to play, it already happened, I reset. <laughs> so um, feel free to reorganize and look through the books and yeah, that's my project. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Hi everyone, give me. Um, so I think it's best to explain my process before getting into what I have in front of me. Um, my project is unified by common themes of subnatural elements. Um, this topic is studied in depth by the architect David Geeson. Initially, my project focused on site visits and research intending to redefine the desirability of sub subnatural elements by exploring their subjectivity. As my project evolved, I began to zero in on surface conditions as a subnatural element. This led to me documenting, documenting eroded and weathered materials across the city. Um, I found a pivotal moment in my research was when I encountered a paper advocating for the preservation of urban ruins. Um, I want to share a quick quote from this paper. Although a ruin's physical state is diminishing, its metaphorical pe potential is expanded at the same time. Ruins are a sense of incompleteness, allowing for new interpretations. What I'm trying to convey here is that ruination is a process where material exists in a state that is not exactly yet a ruin. I think what's important is that denigration and ruination of material is not black and white. There are layers to it. It takes time. It involves interactions with environment and people, and all this memory is stored in its surface quality. 
This perspective, viewing the surface condition of materials as a product and catalog of time rather than a threat to material form fascinated me. Today, the surface quality of buildings or objects are often determined, determines their desirability, which is understandably linked to structural integrity and a sense of oldness. In modern design, emphasis is placed on visual syntax of surface and timelessness, largely neglecting the experiential quality of texture. So with all this research, I had to boil it down and somehow represent it in some sort of physical idea. Um, I wanted to celebrate the tactile qualities of decaying surfaces. I also wanted to replicate their sensory experience um, I had when I was visiting these vacant industrial sites during my exploration. Um, what you see in front of you are tiles that have 3D scan surfaces, surfaces mapped onto them. The surfaces are fragments from various urban ruins and carry these memories of the sites along with them. These tiles aim to speculate if materials can act as a catalog for site occupancy and history. The second part of my physical component was inspired by Giesen's expression of taking a monumental approach rather than a curative one. I wanted to create a conceptual monument um, using these tiles, a monument that could hypothetically be placed around the city and over time each would weather and erode uniquely to one site placement. The form of the monument allows for unique interactions with environment, where some sides interact with some sunlight and some sides don't, where some surfaces interact with precipitation and others don't. I expect I express this through a short animation um, in which I use research of surface deterioration to replicate replicate that process digitally. Um, I also created some still images and renders over here. Um, so that's basically a brief explanation, but if anyone has questions later, I'd love to talk about it more. Mm -hmm. And that's why I'm Kaylee, can, can I add a little something before you go? Yeah, please keep, uh, I mean, I, of course, I, my sense is that we have time for one or two questions while you present, but uh, please keep your questions in mind because we have a round table after that and the public is really uh, is warmly invited to ask questions during that round table. Okay, hi, I'm Kaylee, and this is my project. Um, when I started this, I was really interested in um, how to foster strong relationships with clothes in order to give them a long life and enhance sustainability. Um, and I was really interested in this from the perspective of the clothes that we don't like or that we um, get rid of. So um, yeah, because I was thinking about how like, when you eventually don't like something or don't want to keep it, um, there was a point in time where you liked something about it enough to acquire it. So I was kind of trying to like deconstruct this experience and understand the stories of um, what happens in the life of garments. So I did this by having a clothing swap. And I feel like this worked because when people go to a clothing swap, they've already decided that like this isn't, doesn't work for them anymore. Um, but yeah, and so then I had them tell the stories of detach attachment, but also detachment that they felt with those garments. Um, yeah, and so I collected all of those stories. These items are sad leftover items from the um, clothing swap. So yeah, but so they have the story of attachment and detachment on all of them and some extra stories over there as well. Um, and I spent a lot of time thinking about these stories um, and looking for meaning and patterns. And I think a big thing that I found is that like um, the feelings about them are all mixed up. Like there's feelings about uh, their, their function, their material, their, their physicality, like the way people experience wearing them. And yeah, I found that really interesting. So I ended up writing prompts for a, a way of thinking about um, acquiring new things that start from, yeah, because we know that like usually emotions have a big part of our decision-making around acquiring garments. So instead of putting that first, I put the material, uh, yeah, the materiality, narratives of materiality first um, to think about kind of like the material constraints of garments when we acquire them and like using that as the full first filter around decision-making. Um, yeah, so there's narratives of materiality, of physicality, of functionality, and then finally relationality. And so that's like the emotional experience. And yeah, over here I have some extra little tags and I thought it would be interesting to, since all of this is about detachment to garments, I'm assuming that the clothes you're wearing today 
you're like, like enough <laughs> that you want to keep them. So it would be cool to also share the stories of attachment and detachment to a garment you're wearing. So there'll be time later if you want to come do that. That would be awesome. Thanks. And I'll pass it to Elham. Hello, my name is Elham. Hello, my name is Elham, and I would just like to share with you my project. Uh, the title of my project is Metamorphosis in Textile Narrative. This project, which is the research creations and uh, is the potential of the story uh, telling for living material experience and aims to make it possible to create a platform to understanding the biodesign textile made from the living organism seaweeds and is designing the sustainable narrative to facilitate a meaningful uh, dialogue and co-creation between the non-human living organisms, seaweeds and human. Um, as you know, in the fashion industry, people can express themselves through their uh, clothes. A person's fashion style is able to communicate many stories, personality, emotionally and socially. A style is a simply a way of explaining the complicated things and but the problem with this industry is that every year there is uh there are uh, responsible to many carbon emissions and moving toward a more circular fashion system can be circular textile which is to follow the nature's blueprint by integrating the living process and organic matter into the creating the clothes in this prototype i try to describe the process and narrative that create opportunity to combine the biodesign with digital communication and consumer engagement i point out uh, biometry i point out some of the key insights uh, like biomaterial consumer communication but based on the limited scale of the for this project i just focus on the livingness in the textile uh, for example, which uh, which biodesign material from the living organisms are available for the fashion industry? The living organisms uh, that are used in the fashion are different, such as mycelium, algae, bacteria. But in this project, I just focus on the different types of the seaweeds. And uh, and another uh, things that I focus is the living aesthetics, explaining that how aspect of the livingness came into the expression. This can be the form of the change, which can be caused by the growth, reproduction, movement, internal change. As a result, change can be seen like color changing in the life cycle. Uh, the prototype have uh, a storyline about the living textile, and it is based on the review of the, some of the cases studied and tested by the using the textile, water, and etc. And the outcome is the two different catalog. One of them is uh, a fabric, uh, the, the different types of the fabric uh, that I experiment with the different types of the natural resources of the seaweed. And another one is the life cycle of the living textile and narrative by the poster that described the combinations of the by design with communication and um, consumer engagement by the different types of the uh, diagram. And that's it. This is end of my story. And thank you for your consideration. I would like to introduce the next story. You can rest now by Noah. Thank hey everyone. I'm I'm Noah, and this is my project. You can rest now. Um, you can rest now as a multimedia installation um, that kind of reframes object death not as morbid, but as an opportunity for care. Um, this process started actually with me wanting to resolve the end of the sort of circular fashion loop, wherein um, ideally, once once a textile has really gone through as many life cycles as it can, it, the nutrients contained within it should be returned to earth in some capacity. And the solution I proposed for that was textile composting, um, which is possible for the most part with um, natural fibers. And I kind of started by embodying that process and let that embodiment um, be a way of, of um, finding meaning. So I, I took some fabric scraps from around my studio and I 
did a fair bit of research on kind of designing the ideal compost. And from that, composted those fabric scraps and just went through that process and tried to find meaning within it. Um, at a certain point, I, I realized with the amount of care that I was taking in doing this, that uh, reconsidering this action, not as not as a necessary final step in the circular fashion system, so much as an opportunity for care was really what this project would become about. Um, and the result is this, which is um, this installation. It's composed of a few parts. The first is these pieces here, which are those pieces that I had composted starting, I think, three months ago, um, have been resurrected and pulled out of compost. And then I uh, transform them essentially into a collection of small objects meant to evoke um, objects that people might cherish and act as kind of reference points on which people can map um, objects that they hold dear and um, can sort of consider those objects and reframe how they might let go of those objects as a result. Um, and then the second portion is this video behind me, which uh, documents the process in a sort of abstract way. Uh, it combines video of me sort of enacting this process and and the sort of the, the tactility of it and the involvedness of it um it combines that with some microscopy of the pieces as they have been composting and finally the last the last element is this uh collection of poetry that i wrote in collaboration with my partner talia that just serves as kind of invitations um to allow people to reframe uh, how they look at objects, how they look at objects that they cherish, and how they might consider disposing of those objects. In the end, it, it really just invites people to, to, you know, viscerally get closer to object death and think about how they might give the objects that they cherish a meaningful death and a death that they deserve. I want to just finish reading out um, one of my favorite poems and the final poem in, in the series. Um, it goes as follows. It is only a kind of dying. My mother will be proud and I will be among kin. Thank you very much. I'm going to pass it off to Flo. Hey, hi, my name is Flo and the title of my project is Celle que l'on refuse de tenir dans la coupole de nos mains. It means the one that we refuse to hold in the palms of our hands. Uh, this project is a sensitive and intuitive exploration of materials made from weeds that were foraged in the, uh, wild urban nature in Montreal. Uh, and the goal of this project was to really uh, start conversations around uh, unwanted plants, uh, unwanted lands, and also uh, craft practices. Uh, these are topics that are interesting, that interest me for my master's thesis, and they act, this project act, acted as a start for my reflections. Uh, so growing up in Montreal, I was always very attracted to uh, wild urban nature. Uh, these were places where I could uh, be into nature, but also uh, play freely uh, instead of being in well-designed parks. Um, during an ethical foraging workshop that I did last year, I started to be very interested in weeds. I realized that I uh, wasn't paying attention to those unwanted plants before and that they had a lot to offer. Uh, and I did, I started by doing uh, natural pigments with them. And for this project, I wanted to uh, see what the material potential uh, could be. Uh, but from having a background in ind industrial design, I wanted to stay out of the extractivist way of working with materials uh, and instead use more of a craft approach and work with uh, as much material as possible. Uh, so for the process of this work, uh, I did walks in the city, uh, not only in the wastelands, but also all over the city, because uh, weeds can be found really everywhere, uh, underneath bridges, uh, underneath uh, the balcony of my house. Uh, and I started to identify the plants, uh, pick a few of them, bring them back home. Uh, and then I decided to pay attention more to uh, the witch grass that we have here and the milkweed because I was able to find them in bigger quantities. Uh, so an ethical part of this foraging um, really 
uh, made me take what was in big quantities, but still take as less as possible. Um, yeah, so then I transformed the plants at home in the silence of my house uh, to really get attuned to the materials. Uh, all my senses were really invested in the process. Um, I separated the different parts of the plant, uh, the stems, the bark, the leaves, uh, even the seeds. Uh, and then by separating all of them, I was able to do all kinds of materials. Um, and I had a lot of surprises also with the transformation of them, such as colors, but also quantities. I worked a lot to transform the materials and sometimes very small quantities of pulp were left. So paper making was also a big inspiration for the materials. Um, I did mostly pulps uh, with the fibers that I chose. And I made uh, the artwork that I made around this are very small, uh, useless objects uh, that can fit in the palm of the hand. I wanted to make them as tiny as possible to uh, really think about the connection that the objects have within my hand uh, and uh, to show that this was a process of care. Uh, so here we have a, an object made from the pulp, uh, from the witch grass leaves. We also have the witch grass stem, stems. Um, and here we have the milkweed. And I forage other kinds of materials from those places to put them into conversation and to uh, try to... Uh, try to tell the story of how these plants were found. Uh, and also I made a small zine uh, just to share a few thoughts that I had during the process. I had a sensitive and poetic journal that I used for uh, this exploration, uh, just to uh, remind me of all the feelings that were involved uh, and also how I got attuned to those plants. Um, and finally, I have some pictures here that can show what's gonna happen at the end of the project. I'm gonna put those plant objects back with the plants to let them disintegrate. Merci. We're gonna go discover the project of Deepak. All right. Well, uh, hello everyone. I hope you all can see because my project is limited to a screen. Um, okay, so my project is called as uh, the canvas of culture. And uh, based upon the title, the two terms, canvas and culture. So what do they mean? So the idea, the initial idea was to create elements of any digital surface and add the idea of symbolism to them, right? And uh, when we read the word culture, so what culture are we talking about, right? So to tell you all a little, little more about myself. So I come from India and I specifically talked about the Indian culture because I adore the symbolism, I adore the stories. And the idea behind the project was to integrate symbolism, those stories, those uh, meanings with digital materials. And uh, by digital materials, I mean the elements of the design system. So what I did was incorporate all those elements to design this interactive presentation for you, right? So the first thing, of course, the project explores the intersection of Indian symbolism and digital materials, right? So, and uh, as I just told you, by creating a design system that's inspired by all those stories. And if you click next, all right, are you ready to view the design system? Okay, so starting with the basic elements that's the colors so starting with the color red so the idea behind red was uh in india in stories so what red symbolizes is uh goddess durga so goddess durga is the goddess that represents the feminine energy she represents power marriage and fertility so i thought that okay why not integrate that and uh, you can see in front of the red the word kesar right so kesar is something that's red and added in sweets. So it gives that red color to food. And then we have blue, 
which is called as Jodhpur. And what it symbolizes, it symbolizes rebirth, right? And uh, just to give everyone an idea about the place, so Jodhpur is a city in a place called as Rajasthan. And guess what? It's all blue, right? So the city is branded as blue. And uh, to give everyone an idea what the city is famously known for, here I have the fragrance oil that's very popular in uh, Jodhpur. So you all are free to maybe experience it. Then we have henna green, which symbolizes growth. And uh, what tangible thing I have that symbolizes green is the dried mango leaves, which is again, a very prevalent and dominant thing in Indian cuisines. And then we have turmeric yellow, which symbolizes purity and the cool gray, which symbolizes balance, right? And moving to the typeface. So I thought of combining the intertypeface, which is a very versatile typeface along with Devnagri, that's that is something that's very Hindi and uh, moving to some of the shapes. So the dominant shape that you all can see even incorporated in the buttons is inspired by the Rajasthani tiles. So you can see the inward stroke and uh, the sort of circular shapes that have been subtracted from the rectangle. And then we can see the Rangoli pattern. So what a Rangoli is during the festival of Diwali, which is the festival of lights, which happens during November, so what people do is they make these patterns, these circular patterns on floor, which are made by powdered colors. And uh, it's it adds to the aesthetics of the festival. And then we have the fabric pattern, which was extracted from one of the ethnic wares that they have during these festivals. So what I have in my hand is called as a kurta, right? So you can see the pattern that they have incorporated is that they have used four circles and they have further detailed it more. And then we have the blue shape, that's again, it's a sweet dish called as laddu. So I thought that, okay, why not incorporate that as well? Then shadow. So basically the idea behind shadow is to give elements or components that elevated feel whenever we are having a look at them on the screen so that they appear more tangible. And then some of the icons and some of the interactive button. So the primary red, it has been incorporated in the primary button and as you can see, as soon as I hover my mouse over it, you can see there's a change happening, right? And this is the secondary button, and this is the tertiary button. Then moving on to some of the components that have been used to create the system. So here you can see two cards, right? On the left and the right. They are both interactive, so you can maybe hover your cursor over them to learn more about the card. And all those elements, all the colors, all the shapes, all the elevations, they have been incorporated to create these and moving to some more interactive elements. So if I hover over them, if I click over them, you can interact with them easily. So, and now I invite everyone to just maybe think over them, hover your cursor, play whatever that you feel like. And uh, yeah, that's it. Thank you so much. Yeah. Is it the break? Yeah. Okay, I'll do it. <laughs> okay. All right. So thanks, uh, thanks everyone for the presentation. Uh, it's, it's. I think the the format is really dynamic. I'm really looking forward to uh, hearing more about the process and the techniques and uh, the challenges of these projects after the break because we'll take a twenty minutes break. Okay, twenty minutes. So back in twenty minutes uh, for discussions. It's 3.15, so we'll be back at 3.35. Thanks, everybody.
Uh, and don't hesitate because the discussion that we have right now is not a closed discussion. It's for all of us. Uh, so please um, jump in if you, if you want. So before, I have many questions. I'm sure that Tez has many questions too. Uh, but before I start talking, anyone wants to ask something? No? <laughs> Maybe after, okay. So uh, Tess and I had a chance to discuss during the break and we were like absolutely uh, amazed uh, by those projects and really curious about them. Um, and before we start, maybe I just wanna read a few words that were uh, written in, in the, on the boxes. Um, ripple, anthropomorphic, uh, this is sharp, <laughs> transformative, elegant, pointy, my best friend. <laughs> Blunt spikes, smooth. And what's on the table next to me? Plasticity, uh, crumpled, paper-like fabrics, handkerchief, tender, uh, natural fiber. What are they? And I'm sorry, I'm trying to find a position for reading. Okay. And what is it made for? And so on. So all those little fragments of narratives are, uh, <laughs> are absolutely... Um, I find them really curious because they tell little snippets of the life of, of your objects. And uh, I think that our first question will we, we'll deal with the, this idea of senses that you that you brought forward uh, in uh, in your presentation. So Tez, you want to ask a question about senses? Yeah, absolutely. But first of all, it, it was fantastic with what you did. Who has the microphone? Well, <laughs> just uh, yeah. This, yeah, we'll have to help each other like a big family. Yeah. I'm I'm happy to have been invited to to this presentation. It's really great and uh, actually also a bit unexpected. I I wasn't sure what to uh, what to see, and what to feel. So that's that's the biggest surprise because I'm also very interested in the question of the sciences and the materials also. So great, great work. Thank you. And um, my one one question that is really strong to me is that I see a lot of um, um, a lot of touch here. So there is a, a you know, an, an experience, a very direct experience with the, with the sense of touch and of course with the sense of seeing too, a little bit less with, with the hearing maybe, but you had something at the very beginning. I arrived that there was some sound and I really enjoyed that. It was very silent and so this, um, that, that was really interesting. So what about the, the other senses? I mean, beside that, the, the idea that there are many more senses, and I think some of them have been uh, more or less consciously implemented in your work, but like uh, smell and taste, which are you know the most um, underrated of the five senses, is that something you've been thinking of? It's a general question now, and if so, how would that be integrated in in your work if you have any ideas or if you had any thoughts about it i'd be really interested yeah i had a um a pretty visceral smell experience with my project because i, I was doing composting and um you know these pieces were were in dirt with food waste and like used coffee grounds and all these things for actual months um and opening them up at first it smelled bad but like i was like okay it's 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 not the worst it's it's survivable um and i was sort of always kind of be cognizant of the, the smell and can this be something that i present in in um in a public space and i uh i took them out and i i let them dry a bit and then i went to iron them when i was going to construct my pieces and oh my gosh, my whole apartment just smelled so horrible. So I had to sort of, I had to sort of intervene and say like, you know, maybe while this is definitely an important, like visceral part of this process and anybody who's doing textile composting is going to run into this, like it, it, it's, it's a necessary part of it. I think I, I chose not to include smell so much in the presentation, not only because, you know, I, I didn't want to like present a really uncomfortable experience, but I, I, I wanted to take, um, I wanted to take object death away from like, or death generally away from this idea of more like morbidity. And, and I think the smell that was there really kind of skewed it in that direction and, and made it seem like this 
this this scary process that people wouldn't want to undergo. Um, and I moved it towards something. I, I have roses in the display. It actually smells quite good. Um, and I and I wanted to just sort of bring smell in the direction of of care and of love, as opposed to the real smell that was there in the process, which was a pretty morbid and unpleasant one. Um, but all this is to say that it, it was a consideration um, and something I, I wrestled with a lot. Okay, thank you. Does anyone else have any responses? Um, so let me tell you all the story. Uh, one of the most challenging things about my project was, uh, again, my work, it primarily deals with pixels, right? Things that you see on the screen. So thing that I had, I had to like come up with was, uh, how would I translate all that symbolism into something that's tangible, right? And initially I had plenty of ideas and I discussed with Alice, like how to, how to proceed because it's, it was a pretty big challenge for my project. Right. And then I thought that, okay, I have red in front of me. What object can, reminds me of red? Maybe is this something I can smell, something I can touch. And then I was eating something. Right. And I thought that, okay, I have made this. What all, what all stuff did I incorporate in this? And then the thought came in my mind that, okay, I used a lot of spice. What if I decided to add red chili powder and maybe I can use that to associate with the color red just to make sure that it's something that people can experience and interact with. Maybe just grab it and try to sniff it. Although I don't advise it, don't do it. <laughs> and uh, again, then it started to like, I started to have more ideas. Maybe I can use turmeric to symbolize, to basically symbolize yellow or any other thing. Right. And uh, again, the other challenge that I had in my mind was uh, the color blue. Right. And uh, I thought that, OK, is there any location or any other place that reminds me of the color blue? Right. So there was a time when I was on my I went to a place, right, Jodhpur, just for a couple of days. And the one thing that really fascinated me was the architecture and the color of the buildings. Right? It was all blue. So I, it just reminded me that, okay, maybe I can somehow create linkage. And then Jodhpur is a place that's primarily it's popular for its fragrances, right? So they have these fragrance oils, oils there that, that are extremely popular. And fortunately, I had one, right? So I thought that, okay, what if I decided to bring it and maybe people can sort of sniff it or smell it just to give them that idea or that image so that they can imagine what would it feel like to be at Jodhpur, right? So... This was one of the challenges of my project. And yeah. I think Florence wanted to add something, yeah. Uh, for the plants, I was very surprised because the smells were completely new smells for me uh, because of the, the cooking of the plants. So when I picked them, they were mostly dry uh, and the, the scents was not very important during the process. But when I put them in water and cooked them up, uh, it was really really surprising and it took like the, the the whole house was smelling like plants but yeah so uh, new experiences of the senses during this project anyone else wants to add something i'm curious for instance uh with the sense of touch because we we experience all the objects on the table without knowing what the projects were but for instance i think about your work katie and i think about your work astrid where uh, the, the touch of the, the haptic feeling of the fabric and the haptic feeling of metal is, ve is, is very different. I'm just curious to hear you, like how, how does it play out in your, uh, in your process? Uh, in the sense that it, touching something you like versus touching something you don't like, like I can't touch a blackboard, I cannot, it's impossible for me. So how is it for you in your practice that sense, this sense of touch with fabric and with metal? Yeah, um, I think for me, it was just about making that the sense of touch more like intentional because I think with clothes you feel them all the time but you don't think about them maybe until they're like uncomfortable um and so building the sense of touch more intentionally into the process of like yeah acquiring things or deciding to let go of something um has been interesting and I feel like it's something that I'll continue to think about going forward yeah yeah, I think going off what Kaylee said about um, being uncomfortable, I think um, that's a really interesting aspect when it comes to the material that I'm working with, because it is um, 
like technically a garbage object. Um, I think a general response to garbage is that it, you know, most people don't really want to touch it. And I found that with this because of the, um, the rust that will come off when you do touch it. So it's kind of funny because although I, I think it's so beautiful, I, I'm very like cautious when handling my material. Um, and I think I have to be, and also just in terms of safety with the sharp edges, um, when I was cutting a piece yesterday in the metal shop, I was using the plasma cutter, um, by hand and, and, uh, it lets off so many sparks and they kind of just let you like, you're safe enough just with safety glasses and, and flame proof, uh, gloves. But when I went to do that, like it was the flames were spraying at me like everywhere. And I was so scared that my hair was going to catch on fire. And um, so I, I suited up with like a full jacket and a welding helmet and all this stuff that, you know, you don't really need to to use this um, uh, uh, device. But, um, you know, it's it's like I'm kind of fighting with this material to bring it to its um, like final or like one of its uh, final states. So. Um, yeah, I don't know. I just, I think it's really interesting looking at like comfort and discomfort when it comes to loving or not loving a material. Hmm. Yeah. Interesting. The smaller object in your piece is mm -hmm. also for holding things sand. Yeah, so I... Uh, I missed the sand. I know. I just didn't think I could really. I think that was another thing is like the limitations of the space, you know. So I think a lot of our projects are dealing with um, intentional uh, or like establishing intentional reactions or interactions with these objects. And a lot of those um, are not possible in every space. And um, a lot of them don't happen all the time. So, you know, like uh, I'm not going to be uh dealing with this material once it's become the nightstand and I put it in my room it's just going to be there and it's going to have a different use and so I think um where am I going with this basically just like uh looking at the material and highlighting any intentional interactions we have with it but also knowing that there will be more that will exist outside of that. And I think that's a big thing of, of us respecting the material and, and its own life and its own story is that we're not going to be able to completely define it. And we're not going to be able to um, like know its entire life. So I don't know if that makes sense. Yeah. I just had a thought um, with reference to kind of uh, what which which senses we chose to focus on? I think a lot of it did kind of come back to the limitations of the space to a certain extent. I mean, you can you can look at something and see it, but not look at it, and therefore not have to see it. And you can touch something and feel it, but without touching it, you don't necessarily have to be feeling it. Whereas you know, in a in a this in an exhibition with a bunch of other people, you can't choose to not smell something, and you can't choose to not hear something. So smell and hearing kind of ended up being um, less in focus within our individual um, individual exhibitions, it's just simply yeah, yeah, and I and I think I think the the, the... as artists, I think you should be a little bit less sensorially correct. You know I, mean? <laughs> I think that's fair. Yeah, but this is something that you want to do. So if it's really something you want to do, then you know you should not care about. Yeah. You know, if you can in the space, it's just something you do. I'm just mine is just a suggestion to you know to explore the, the possibility of integrating this other thing without thinking thinking too much without the limitation of other things. Oh, if you think that that is important, then you know I think it's worth uh, exploring it and and daring. And it's true that it's more invasive. I mean, it's it's uh, that's that is true. But maybe we. Some solution can be found, you know, I think. And uh, at least I did. <laughs> In fact. Yeah. I was just going to say quickly in response to that, I think I didn't light a piece of incense right now because I was kind of also thinking of like showing the piece as if it would be in a store, like um, just letting the the object be the functional object in itself and then you know, once it's taken into the domestic space, that's when it'll actually be used. 
but right now I just want it to be as it is. And even Noah had made a suggestion to put like nightstand objects onto it, like an alarm clock or something, but I just wanted to let it exist because I'm going to use it as a nightstand, but you know, maybe someone else would want to use it as something else. So. Yeah, I think throughout the process of many of our projects, the other senses other than touch and sight were much more involved, like with mine with making bioplastics, like the smell of gelatin when you're cooking it isn't exactly pleasant, but that's also something that if you're using an animal product, you have to face. And mm -hmm. in this case, using gelatin means that it's compostable. And I'm making a product that I know will be able to return back to an original state or be composted instead of just being another garbage object. And with the other sense of like hearing, like the sound, at least in my project, of carving and of sanding was very involved and very <laughs> time consuming. And I got to experience that for a very long time. And with smell further with that, with the sawdust, like adding that to the bioplastic creates quite strong smell, but that is much more of a pleasant smell than the just gelatin. And so on one side, it is nice to be able to include the audience and those other senses, but it's also kind of nice that these were my intimate experiences with my materials, that I heard all the sawdust. And when I was in the valley like, collecting my tree branches, I listened to the birds and I listened to just the runners on the path beside and the sound of the stream beside where the tree is. And that was part of my experience. And so I can share that experience and like share that to my audience, but I was there to experience it. And so that keeps that part of the project as a personal aspect. Whereas now my final product that's over on the table and out in the world will be what's to share. And that's the touch and that's the more visual aspect of it. Thanks, Anna. I have a follow-up question for uh, those working across the digital, because uh, of course, working on your project and touch base on what you mentioned, Anna, uh, you were engaged with your rubbles, you were engaged with your fabrics, but after that you have to create a translation of it and some kind of representation of, a, of, a, of haptics, of the beautiful captain embroidery, for instance. How do you translate that in an application and how do you translate that rubble texture in, in, in a software? So could you speak a little bit about that translation process in your work? Uh, for me, it was very difficult because uh, I, I I don't know. I work with a lot of uh, people who are not used to, to work with digital. Like uh, I met with a lot of uh, small designers, just hobbyists, uh, just people who work with Scrum. And uh, me, I like this. I have this kind of view on how data should be traded and uh, how, mm -hmm. you know, it needs to be efficient. It needs to be clear. And I realize it's not like that for everyone. So um, I don't know. It was hard to kind of. Uh, it's, I think it's still hard. Like, I feel like there's still too much of me in 2D app. Like it's too, too, uh, too square, too, too, um, I don't know, too, too restrained. And, um, I think like the goal was like, I, I don't know, like to, to really open myself up to it. Just the platform. Uh, I, I, I want, I really wanted to do it on the computer first and everyone told me, no, no, that's not going to work on the computer. No one uses a computer when you're you know, your computer is a way you, you know, it needs to be something that's quick that you have access to it. So for me, it was kind of a, mm -hmm. I don't know, uh, not only like working with the digital material, but how you interact with it. For me, it was very different. My approach was very different than the people I, I interviewed and I, I talked with. So yeah, I think that was a challenge to kind of uh, change how I perceive things and how things are. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I don't know, maybe ask a question then. Yeah, but maybe I'll, uh, I can have two microphones, but I have two microphones. Yeah. So, and I to offer the microphone to the public. I'm just curious to to hear you. How is uh, how are uh, the senses uh, uh, impacting your work and impacting uh, the experience of your work? Uh, I'm thinking, for instance, about Megan who works with kombucha, which is very smelly. How do you engage with that? Yeah, the question is for you. <laughs> um, it actually didn't work. I don't have any kombucha. Okay, but, but you uh, worked with it. Yeah, I, we got... I did have it in my closet and all my clothes still smell like it. Okay. So that is that. But um, I feel like I don't really smell it anymore. But then my roommate was like, 
<laughs> Everything smells like yeah. vinegar. I work with a lot of dyes too. Uh, that had a lot of vinegar, and I've had that smell around also. Uh huh. That I guess I got used to. Interesting. Um, yeah. And then, I it's like in period. So when I was making, I was like, I like, it's not an option. This has to happen. It has to be smelly, and it's okay. And then it'll go away. And my kombucha all dried out, and now it doesn't smell anything. Um, the dried one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The yeah, dried yeah, yeah. One, yeah. Okay. So now you have you have dry surfaces. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. we'll see that tomorrow, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. Some okay. Yeah. yeah. Great. So then, anyone else has a a special relationship with with smell and material or touch and material? Oh, bet. Yes. Taste. <laughs> taste. Yes, true. We forget taste. Uh. Um. Yeah. So I was using uh Damar resin for one of my bio composites that I made, which is like a natural resin from a type of tree. And it's, uh, I was like melting it and then mixing um, aggregate with it. And the Damar resin has like a really strong smell that filled my house for, for hours after each time I made it. And also you wouldn't think that like concrete rubbles have a smell, but when you heat them up and mix them with other things and like cook them on your stove top, it smells like ground I don't know how you describe what that smells like but yeah that was a interesting new smell um that I experienced a lot throughout this project that I wouldn't have known about otherwise but that's interesting there's a French artist called Anaïs Tondard who did a whole piece about petrichor which is the, the the smell of soil after rain so she did it she did it about urban soils so it's a uh, really interesting but uh I'm, I'm curious Ellen did you smell the rubbles? <laughs> uh, no, I did not smell the rubbles. But um, yeah, back to the digital question. Um, <laughs> sorry, I needed a second to get my. Uh, oh, that's that's back. fine. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I um, I think the whole project was about finding a, a connection again to these these weathered and, and eroded materials, and um, translated into the digital was a tool for me to show this process and make it more tangible like with my animation um weathering and erosion is a process that happens over a long period of time and sometimes when you don't see it it's hard to find a meaning and a connection there so to create sorry am i not talking close enough um <laughs> to create this animation and show this process a little closer closer um allowed at least myself to build a connection to this process um and the digital was a tool for me to do this mm -hmm. interesting i'd like to uh, maybe move on to uh to a next question about the question of uh, attunement and the question of material transition uh as a form as i perceived of um, attuning to the material agency of objects uh but also as a way to fostering ecological transition, but not in a solutionist manner, but rather in a more speculative and critical manner. Um, so could you share a moment or, or an example of a moment in your process uh, where material transition operated, whether it operated on you as a designer or on the material itself or on the outcome of the project? And how does that inform your practice, this idea of transition? How do you envision it? Because you all have this idea of cycle and, and iteration and loops in, in your work. But I'm really curious if we could like delve a little bit more into the, the, the detail of the process itself, be it uh, physical, material, digital, social. How did it work, this idea of transition? Someone wants to jump in? Noah? Yeah. Um, personally, as, as we were going through all of the, all of the projects, I think I, I always came back to conceiving of like an entire life cycle for a given material and, um, especially clothing, seeing as, um, seeing as that's what I dealt with, but, but more generally, I think just envisioning this, um, as kind of documenting the life of an object. I, I liked looking at all of our projects as sort of finding kind of human analogs for the processes that they're undergoing. Um, like I sort of, I envision like Kaylee's project as though objects are changing careers to an extent and Sid's project <laughs> kind of as though they're retiring and they're able to just like, you know, they're, they're moving to Florida and they're just sitting back and they're having fun and, and, and they don't have to work, you know, they can just, they can just be what they want to be. Um, and then finally my project kind of as, as uh, like death for an object and I think um, 
it's cool to it's it's cool to really you know um encapsulate those within these like visceral material like these kind of functional transitions as demarcated by these really um tactile material transitions um in my case i think what i realize is that uh, a good death for materials and for objects can take a really long time my objects didn't actually compost that much um they kind of eco died which was interesting um but i think i think one thing one thing that i did learn was you know the the space of a semester to really um find a way to give a meaningful death to these objects sometimes it isn't enough and sometimes transi transitions like this can take a really long time um, and that was something i kind of had to learn by doing that, but i'm very grateful that i did yeah um yeah kind of to go off of that thought of like time i would say that all of the objects that i've like collected are forever in it transitional like state like I don't know that they'll ever become anything and I question like what do I do with them now or where do they go from here do I give them away do I try to turn them into something functional do they stay ambiguous um I think um at least within this program as a design student we're always creating functional objects um but what is it to make something that can just yeah be there and just serve time um and then on 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 my side it took me kind of i had a transition of being like away from making um where i just facilitated space so all of the objects that were brought um in my project were like given to me i think i i only have two that i gave away um so that took away my um authority in a way and and I received them and I was like okay now what can they do I collected some histories from them but some things I don't know about them um and then the outcome was a lot about me observing the space and just creating situations that could possibly happen and then through the workshops I had so much like joy of just watching people play um and um yeah it, it more transformed my position as a designer whatever that means to me I'm still figuring that out but yeah if I'm the material <laughs> I transitioned anyone else wants to uh, offer detail on that uh I feel like my the materials I used in physically transition but uh, like just by uh, scanning them and like getting information about them and then suddenly they have like a trace somewhere you know in a in a server and they, they kind of extend like their their presence i would say like mm -hmm. uh I, I wouldn't say like it's yeah it's not a physical transition but i think like they kind of transition in a way because now you're there's a record of them there's a they they have like a, a new space where they exist and like this space can be used to communicate between people and so yeah i think that that was an interesting uh, i kind of uh, figured out when i worked on a project so yeah yeah something that was really interesting and something that i hadn't experienced before with my project was creating a semi-liquid wood where <laughs> what is tell us more <laughs> what is that <laughs> well wood is typically either a solid or in dust form or like chip form but then in the process of bioplastics uh, you mix it with water and with liquidized gelatin and glycerin and then adding in the sawdust then yeah you get this semi-liquid form that can either be spread flat like to make a sheet or it can be put into another form to make a mold or that can be hand built and so it has some similar qualities like ceramics and like clay but it's this new material and yeah it was just very interesting to take something that I've only ever experienced in a solid form or in dust form and instead like oh it now is a liquid and there are so many more possibilities with this new type of material and that's something that can be explored in so many new ways in the future yeah. so which kind of objects would you imagine made of this new material 
well <laughs> something the 100 dollar question <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah because there are like in my own practice uh, i do make a lot of small objects and so it would be nice to make wooden small objects and then make similar ones out of my bioplastic liquid wood or use it kind of like concrete in uh, like solidifying structures or like I thought a little bit about how concrete uses rebar like steel rebar you would, but you will keep in your house like you make it and say oh I won't do it I mean I've made a lot of wooden candle holders so I could oh, make yeah, cool. some yeah. bioplastic candle holders that'd be yeah. fun but yeah like reinforced concrete with sticks but it's actually bioplastic that would be kind of fun yeah. there's also the interesting dimension of like there are some shapes that don't make sense to make out of solid wood. Like, you know, tre trees are only so big and wood only behaves in certain ways. And for the most part, building with wood is subtractive, right? Especially when you're working with carving, you're, you're, you're starting with a tree and then you're reducing it into something useful. Whereas with the liquid form, you can imagine it additively and you can imagine shapes that simply don't make sense to be worked subtractively from wood, which is a, a really cool nuance to add. And, a, and it's nice that you've kind of opened that door. Mm -hmm. Anyone else wants to speak about this this idea of transition? Yeah, I think my project kind of related to how Arnaud thought about transition. I think when we were deciding on words, we were talking about like transformation versus transition. And we decided on transition because like transformation feels so like the thing changes and becomes something else to me. Um, but I think in my project as well, it was about the transition of relationships and it was cool to see how that happened both in for the people who were like acquiring new things through swapping but also how relationships transitioned um, from the people who were giving their things away and how that relationship transitioned from like maybe guilt or like discomfort to joy and like seeing their friends be happy and I liked that yeah yeah We have another microphone. Um, yeah, kind of just to go off of that, um, one of the objects I have is a candlestick holder and it lived in my friend's basement for like a really long time and it was something that she like never, never used. And then I brought it to the workshop and then my other friend saw it and she was just like, when, when you don't need this anymore, I really want it. So like how the value of something changes, like just through like seeing something new too, it's like, this is new. I'm like, yeah, I'm obsessed. So I think maybe when, yeah, when you don't have a history to something, it, uh, the value is changed or um, yeah, just a thought of something. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think it's interesting because you, you all spoke about transition as a form of, of temporality, as a form of displacement, uh, as a pos positionality as a designer. I'm curious to hear uh, when, because I see this idea of like social bonds that, that's forming. And I'm curious to hear, for example, uh, Cathy, when, when you, uh, when you engage with the, with your community and one of something that was transitioning are someone else's emotion into your book. So your family's emotion, your friend's emotion, your community's emotion, they were translated onto paper in your book. So I'm just wondering, like, how did that operate it? Because you spoke a little bit about your in your presentation about how uh, it created like some difficulties because people needed time. And it goes back to this idea of temporality. But how do you, how did people react to this prompt of, as you said in your title, dumping your your emotions uh, on paper? How did the emotions transition from someone else to your book? That's my question. Um, for me, I think it actually transitioned pretty well like even some friends that didn't use to journal before like they still tried to do it to help me and also was able to see how they actually feel and it's like a side of them that I never thought of before so for them to uh, transition those thoughts to me I think it was really like uh, I felt also grateful about that so for me um like their emotions also transition to me in a way. Thank you. Do you have a question? Yes. Yeah. Uh, 
I was actually <clears throat> fascinated by your the ending of your presentation with giving back to nature, like your your artwork, and then it, it disintegrates. That's what you say, right? In uh, in, uh, in nature, so it goes back. In that's a transition into another form, right? Into an, a natural form. And I was thinking also, oh, that's you know that's actually done in collaboration with some other agents like microorganisms or natural elements that transform the material. So I was just curious if you ever, any of you ever ever thought to collaborate with other material, other living materials, maybe to create something or to disintegrate something. That's also very interesting. I spent a lot of time, sorry, I spent a lot of time thinking about how I could best collaborate with other materials because I, obviously I was working with composting, which is reliant on exactly that. Um, and and probably a majority of like the hard research that I was doing was into what what can I do to encourage collaboration with with um, biological organisms and and the like proliferation of these organisms in order to do exactly that to to give back. Um, and, and I really like positioning it as that wherein I'm collaborating with nature um, in order to, to, to give back to nature. Like it's, it's a sort of, it feels very reciprocal um, because on the one hand I, I get to give a meaningful death to, to something I care about and, and I get, I get to allow it uh, to give back to nature and nature gets from that nutrients that it really needs. Um, and it's that reciprocity sort of mirrors, you know, the, there's a kind of inverse reciprocity to the extraction that began that process. Um, and it's nice. I feel like it is to an extent setting things right. Um, and kind of, kind of calms some of that, that like extractivist production guilt that I think a lot of us as designers can feel sometimes. Wait, would that be great to see some microorganisms in your video, like something? Yeah. Crazy? Yeah, for sure. I think that was a sort of a limit of um, of facilities I had access to and and time constraints, but I, I, that, that's what I was hoping for, for sure. Yeah. Anyone else wants to uh, to add to this about this collaboration with the more than human and the? Um, I think for the act of giving back the object to the nature at the end of the project, there is the. Uh, interaction between the, the made object and the nature that's that's going to dissolve it but also what one of the intentions that I had for that was to uh, make people observe these objects to then observe the landscape uh, that they're into so there is like a lot of interrelations that come into play uh, just in this act of humans non-humans and the actual landscape Okay. And I'm curious to hear, um, you know, you, you worked in wastelands and abandoned lands, but also in the liminal spaces of the sea. And <clears throat> I'm curious to, um, to hear uh, you say, in, it, Elan, it's not necessarily obvious in the result of the 3D rendering, but you were in those spaces too, not the same spaces, but the same kind of liminal spaces of or subnatural spaces, as David Gissens puts it. So what was your experience of working in, in those spaces? Um, they don't exist. <laughs> um, when I first went into my project, and I spoke about this in the in the midterm as well, but um, those spaces don't really exist anymore in, in at least in our urban environment, is um, these vacant ruins is they're usually private property. <laughs> and um, yeah, I, I honestly they were they were harder to find than I thought they were. Anyone else wants to uh, jump in on that uh, question that Tez had about uh, collaboration with the uh, with the, the nature and the human and giving back? No. I have um I have many other questions for you. <laughs> How much time do we have actually? Do we uh okay for seventeen? Okay, so you um all your projects put forward some a very important ethics of making like at different levels. Be it be it social, be it 
by engaging in, in, in workshop, by, by engaging with texture, <clears throat> with spaces, with people. And and I'm just curious that you know you, you put forward in your in your abstract the, the word attunement. And attunement is a very interesting word because it, it speaks about this kind of harmony with, with other beings or what Tez was mentioning before. But not everything is always ever harmonious. So I'm curious about what are the frictions in your practice? What are the zones of frictions? Like what was difficult? What was a challenge? And like, how did you navigate those situations? Who won? Um, I think because I'm asking what else objects want to do, I'm confronted with the fact that I'm still informing how they behave. So I, at the end of the day, it was still like human beings in doing something to objects. Um, mm -hmm. So in order to kind of, to start to uh, change how we work with them, our hands have so much history, like we hold things and we know what to do with an object because they're mostly made for our hands. So what if we put them somewhere else on our body? What if we uh, challenge like how our body meets the object? Um, was a way of kind of, yeah, trying to interrupt that friction that I have of of um, creating something that's unknown or something that my body doesn't have a history of knowing this object in this way, which is something to try. I think I, I ran into a fair bit of friction with like the process of composting something successfully isn't easy. Um, and and it, there's a there's a lot of friction like there's there's smells and the weather got bad so it made it or i mean you know winter happens and it, and it and it made the the labor of of um of taking these composts and turning them and being being rigorous about it all the more difficult and and at a certain point i i realized that just as with caring for a person um there's a reason the term like labor of love exists and i think that friction often made my project all the more meaningful um i think if it was really easy to give a meaningful death to these cherished objects it wouldn't be nearly as meaningful and i think the fact um that we're willing to to um sort of do the work of care is more is more kind of potent than if it was just a if doing so was really easy and as such, I'm kind of just grateful for that difficulty and that friction. Yeah, I found the most challenging aspect of this project to actually make sure that all of my thoughts could come across as clearly as possible beyond just, yeah, here are my objects and I like my objects and I want people to see and touch my objects. But, in <laughs> <laughs> but instead, like the the full intention behind the material from kind of start to or at least like start of when it comes into my possession to the entire process of when it's in my possession with the intention of it one day not being in my possession but being able to be disposed of in a, as sustainable a way as possible of course there are always limitations when it comes to composting but the intention is that it will be able to be like disposed of at some point when its life is over. But in making sure that I could really incorporate all of the thoughts of intention and like finding natural elements like paths and rivers in the environment where the tree is, but then also in the carving process, trying to find those similar paths and rivers in the tree bark and in the wood as I'm carving and seeing what can be exposed while carving because that's the entire process of woodworking it's all exploration and seeing what material can bring and so making all of those thoughts come out and that's also why i made a book like i had to find a way to make it tangible another mm. way. Uh, i mean i feel like there was a lot of friction in my project because uh, there's still a lot of friction and i think like it it all comes to uh kind of the user experience the technical difficulties and because uh, i had like this idea and uh, i feel like the whole project was kind of 
uh, solving problems to make this idea like possible. So, and uh, uh, I don't, I don't know. I think, uh, yeah, I think the frictions were really there, and because, uh, uh, and it's more like uh, on how to open myself a little bit to, and uh, put myself in the place of other people who can actually use it because I'm not really working with textile. So I think the friction was in technical abilities, but also in my way of understanding how people will approach it and uh, use it effectively. So, yeah. Okay. Um, kind of going off of that and like catering to other people and people who will be using things, I, I had some challenges with, with um like thinking about taste and universalness and, you know, trying to appeal to like a large market. Um, since I'm trying to make something like gross and old become beautiful, you know, that's like solely based on my taste and, and a lot of the people that I surround myself with who have similar tastes, but I'm wondering like how this would be able to be translated to a larger public and how, um, you know, like if there, at first I was thinking like if there was some sort of symbolism or um, like uh, visual language that I could like adhere onto the material to make it more universally like liked. But then I don't know, I kind of was led away from that idea because, you know, taste is so subjective and um, there's not really a way to make something that everyone is going to like. And that's just something I feel like I had to accept. So, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, just a good end. <laughs> But it, that's interesting because I remember at the the, the midterm prototype, you you add you still add in mind this the, this idea of motif and like what do you do with a pattern and what does a pattern mean? So it's it's how do you how did you get away with that? Like with this idea of like yeah, well I was like I don't I think I just like to draw patterns, <laughs> so I was you know taking patterns from like books of of different like motifs throughout history and different design motifs and like um things that are associated with architecture and time period and and I was like thinking about this idea of ornament as like something that we um are kind of like losing and then I think you know <clears throat> my project now has seemingly become way more modern than I wanted it to be honestly but um I did include like the arch shape which was a little bit um alluding to 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 those architectural factors but um generally i think it like you know i couldn't just pick one style there wasn't a way to like merge all these styles into into one thing so i think it's like the the direction i wanted to go which was to like try and like save ornament ended up kind of like turning back around the other way and i ended up going with something simpler because it was more universally acceptable but i i think i'm like need to get away from that again but I just keep falling in, back into this idea of like minimalism and like simple shapes and um clean lines but I I I don't know it's like a constant internal struggle so still dealing with it okay basically. okay okay I won't insist <laughs> anyone else wants to share a, a zones of friction that can be productive actually uh, in my case, I was seeing the attunement with the material as something very soft, very caring, but then uh, something happened when a, a plant resisted me. Uh, the, oh. <laughs> the witchgrass had tiny hairs on them, and when I was handling all the leaves, uh, they were like going into my fingers, and it was hurtful. Uh, so then I was confronted with the fact that I wanted to interact with this plant so much, but the plant didn't want to interact with me. Uh, then I tried to put gloves uh, to not have those hairs on me. And then I rejected this idea ju and just went for it. And uh, it hurt. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> Anyone else wants to share? I don't know, Sydney, Elan, Cathy, Deepak? You want to add something about zones of frictions in the in the process before we go back to the concept yeah, of attunement? Uh, as I already discussed, that the project was primarily digital, right? It was limited to a screen, and uh, slowly I incorporated something that would cater to the sense of smell by the use of certain spices or certain fragrances. 
and uh, I wish I had the ceramic tile that I was talking about that suggested that shape, you know, mm -hmm. the shape of the button, maybe the shape of the ca card, something like that. Mm -hmm. So uh, transforming or symbolizing something that's digital to something that's maybe tangible, you can touch it, feel it, interact with it. That was one of the most paramount challenge of my project, I would say. Mm -hmm. Elan? You want to say something? <laughs> um, I guess uh, friction with mine was um. Yeah, to speak. Yeah, um, <laughs> kind of walking between the line of of um celebrating sub natures, but not trying to recreate them at the same time, um, because it is it's a natural process, and you and you don't really want to um interfere with that or, or try to replicate it but I was also trying to connect with the material through this um mm -hmm. so that was kind of a friction I I was finding my way through so, so maybe you want to yeah you did share about the collective yeah. process and the yeah okay so this I have another question for you and this is kind of an extension of um of uh, th this idea of friction because in in your statement, which I find I find absolutely um, amazing in its way of of positioning yourself, uh, you speak about cherishment, you speak about longevity, you speak about attunement, and this is interesting because it's a it's it's a position you take as an artist, as a designer, and it's a position of care, it's a position of maintenance, it's a position of engagement. It's very critical and ethical. What is my question, I don't know how to ask my question, but I will try to ask my question. And <laughs> in under those circumstances, can you fail? And what would be failure under those circumstances? I think that the objects cannot turn out as you intend, mm -hmm. but I wouldn't say that that's a failure in any way. Like it, it might be a failure of the intended for shape or intended for surface or texture, but you still learn from that. And you learn maybe how to change your method of production or like with my bioplastics, they mold it a lot. And that was just part of it. And I did not intend for that and didn't particularly want it. However, then with the growing of mold, and the different patterns and colors, I also realized that it resembled the lichen that was on the branches a lot. And so that kind of not, not intentional failure, not failure in any way, but that other aspect of it led to a realization. And with any aspect of our project, we can learn from it. And even, yeah, even if it's not intentional, that's still a method of learning either in a different way of thinking about our objects and projects or a different mode of production. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So the, the abstract that you're referencing uses the word fail three times. Um, but we fail, we fail, that's true. Yeah. yeah. Um, so it's, it's interesting that you draw on that. And I think that is to say that that I do I do think that you can fail. And I think you can fail in the ways that, that we described with that abstract. Like a failure is not, a project not going how you how you expect, but rather um, a f like a failure. I think in our context is just like a failure to care. If you if you it, it, a failure is 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 not subverting those failures that 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 we argue kind of you know our, our culture of disposability relies upon. Um, I think we all. I would I would argue I think we all were were successful in subverting those things and, and I think we don't just perpetuate those failures further but I think I think a failure in our context is exactly that is perpetuating um, the long-standing failures that that make the culture of disposability the way that it is. Just adding on to that, um, I feel like failure is quite like a humanistic and like anthrop centric did I say that right um point of view you know and and it's like our shared value here is that we are trying to like look away from that and instead like let the material be its own being and so I think like placing 
like a judgment onto the material itself is going totally against like what we're actually talking about. And I think, you know, maybe like understanding, um, yeah, like what Noah just said, like how if something doesn't go the way we thought it would, that's not a, a failure. It's it's but I think like yeah. there. Yeah, there is no like total failure when it when it comes to the way that we're dealing with these things, because that's just not the mindset that we have. And, um, you know, I don't think the material can't fail unless we think it did fail, if that makes sense, you know? Yeah, so. yeah it makes total sense. And I find your group very interesting in that we have uh, uh, reconsidering the notion of failure as as a process, not an end result. I mean, we like we may fail at one recipe of something, but then it brings us somewhere. So the failure is not an end, end point. So I find it really interesting in terms of like position uh, in your group. And also in terms of reconsidering what it means to succeed, what does it mean? Like if like if failure is not necessarily a possibility, but it's rather a process, what is success? Is it also part of the process? So I kind of, I find this position really interesting. So uh, I have a, maybe a, a question uh, uh, for you, uh, but before that, I will just inquire. Anyone wants to ask something in the public? Yeah. <laughs> um hi i was just wondering if um by organizing this like exhibition collectively if your projects uh, started to influence uh, each other uh, if so like how and also how do you think that making a project within the lens of critical materiality like how that did that sort of orient your practice uh, in the future or how did it impact your your future work so more general questions. I think um, about the la the second half of that question there, I feel like um, I was a lot more intentional with what I was doing and I went a lot slower than I normally would. Normally I'm, I work in kind of like rash ways, um, but with this project, I, I really took my time. So that's just like for me, my personal experience. I think I, I very much agree with Astrid. There's a um, pretty big focus on like th this class is about going through a process and then presenting where you are in that process at the end of the class. And I and I think positioning it that way um, did really change the way that I worked. And, and I was I was able to think of think of a sort of end output as being. Um, a checkpoint and it made it made me very willing to just kind of work with the material at the pace that it was meant to go um, which I think I think is a pretty valuable lesson and is not something that I think I'm otherwise that good at um, so I'm, I'm grateful for that yeah for the first part of the question I think working as a group was really inspiring just to see the amount of care that everyone wanted to put into this project and did put into this project. I think we all took this prompt and idea in very different directions, but having our kind of five keywords that really connect our project and working as a group together to think through like, transitions and to think through the process of diversion and cherishing, yeah, it was really lovely to see how that can have so many different physical manifestations. Then for the second part, I feel like with my project, it really is kind of a starting point to a large future of my artistic and creative journey. Like I, I plan on working with wood for a long time and yeah, being able to think through the process of woodworking so thoroughly and also find alternatives for the waste that I, that I inevitably put out. Yeah, it, it does feel like a very good starting point to something that I will continue doing for a long time. Anyone else? Sorry, I just, I, I wanted to add, speaking to, again, the first part of the, the <laughs> question, I think um, one of my favorite exercises in in um, assembling this event was was making the poster. The poster is a is an assembly of... Um, these, these bars and each one represents the extent to which we each relate to each keyword. And I, and I think um, 
I think that was a fantastic idea. And I'm really grateful to my teammates for, for pulling that together. And I think it was so cool to, to, to have the system through which we could relate to each other. And we could, we could look at this and we could see um, the extent to which each of us has in common with one another. And I, and I think it, I don't, I don't know that I necessarily think it changed the meaning of my project, but I, I felt some, some like kinship in that, which I think was really, really nice. Yeah, I think again to the first part, um, there is something interesting about like hearing about everyone's work and then seeing patterns or like parts of ways of thinking that were articulated in a certain way that felt relatable. And I think for me, it was really clarifying and not that it changed it, but it gave like this like kind of structure and system to relate to as I was thinking. And I found that really helpful and like inspiring. So yeah. Anyone else wants to uh, say something about where, where this brings your future practice? That was, I think, second part of uh, Junior's question. What those, how those, those methods inform your future work you think or might think of now? It might change, of course. No. It's not really related to future practices, but I just had a flashback of the, I think, the first week that we... Uh, went into this class we brought objects that were uh, objects of affection to us and i see like all the connections of the the objects that you brought into the projects and i feel like this class really allowed to uh, maybe deepen the the connection that we already had with our materials or places uh, and that made it really interesting for future practices also mm -hmm. to really have this kind of workshop to play around and yeah extend conversations with those objects and, and I'm curious for um I don't want to put you in a category Arnaud and Elan <laughs> that's not what I want to do but you you're the, the ones that work with the and, and Deepak as well with the digital how does that material engagement change the way you approach the digital uh, me, it really changed like my perspective on my practice because that's not something I really thought about before, you know, like the impact of my work and how it affected like the, the material world, we could say, because I was always used to uh, working with digital uh, project and everything and working with materials uh, really changed my perspective on that. It also changed my perspective on how my digital work also affects the materiality, like uh, we have a project that talks about that as well. Mm -hmm. But also researching, uh, like uh, the, the the like the readings we had to do. A lot of them were about like the the kind of uh, indirect impact of uh, of like uh, of our practices, and uh, it really made me think about in the future how I can approach my practice in a more like uh, with that in mind, which is not something I've uh, I've done before. Mm -hmm. And I think this kind of opened my eyes to that. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Uh, so if I really think about, I mean, the case with each, I mean, the project that we all had was the idea of storytelling, right? Ultimately, we all were telling stories through our work. So I feel like uh, with the case of my project was uh, the extensive use of symbolism, right? So ultimately what symbols are, they are visual signifiers of certain stories and certain ideas, right? And how I showed them was uh, I depicted them through shapes, maybe through motion, through the use of colors, through certain kind of elevation or so stuff like that. Mm -hmm. So I feel like, uh, and yeah, of course, what entails as colors, they influence emotions, right? Maybe red invokes certain kind of emotions, maybe yellow or something like that. So I feel like maybe to incorporate more storytelling in my work to just retain that attention or maybe to convey a deeper sense of meaning in what I do. So yeah, storytelling is going to be something that might become an integral part of how I, how I proceed my work now. So yeah. Mm -hmm. Yep. <laughs> so it's a, it's a my question is attached to the to the question that was asked before, and um, it's uh, about the idea of uh, working together. So it's um, so not so much about you know putting together a show or, or an exhibition or 
uh, presentation, but more like did this experience or other experiences like inspire you to actually collaborate together to to create something that is more than just your own work? And how will that work for you? Um, so to my knowledge, we haven't talked about collaborating as a group with us past this, um, although I would be open to it. I think collaboration is um, like incredible and extremely important. And I think, um, you know, a lot of the people in our class are in different programs, different levels of their degree. And I think that that was a really nice experience to to work with, um, you know, a whole uh, group of students it's not just like um we're all at the same level so um that was interesting but further than that yeah collaboration is so important when it comes to um you know uh creating like new ideas and 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 pushing the boundaries of of certain um um uh, things so yeah sorry i just got so sleepy but it's a great thing and i would be open to doing it but we haven't said anything yeah. um, about that yet so but yeah no, thanks for for clarifying astrid because you you are a kind of ad hoc group within the context of this discourse but and like that would be amazing if you start collaborating together in different configuration but i think we can also extend the concept of collaboration to stakeholders your middle shop uh, citizens, <laughs> uh, where when you know we we all we had those discussions about uh, those contested places in Montreal that are already very um, there's a spotlight on them. So do you, how does that change the way you work and collaborate with different stakeholders? Uh, for instance, I don't know the wood shop is a form of collaborator in your project. Beyond the material, there are tons of like stakeholders that you can that you can include so uh maybe there's not going to be a collaboration between all of you now 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 tomorrow morning but i'm just curious how does how does this kind of ethical positioning that you put forward so beautifully uh, as a group can translate in different forms of collaboration or forms of interaction with with the public or with others fashion designers uh, composters or farmers i don't know who but what do you how can you speculate different future uh links to the outward uh, world beyond university and what do you want to bring forward i'm just curious it's a big question but there's no good answer so you can speculate with me so. uh for the case of my project i already did a bit of collaboration by asking people uh, the communities that live that organize activities and are very engaged in these white wastelands, how uh, how those people feel about me picking uh, plants for a project. So I already opened the collaboration and the, uh, the answers were very surprising. People were not happy about having someone wanting to extract resources from this space that they're trying to protect. Uh, so this is definitely something that's going to be very important for future mm -hmm. projects. Uh, and in my case, a, a master's research creation project. Mm -hmm. I think that what we're doing here is a very good first step. Like a lot of our projects are interactive and like, yeah, there's the interactive aspect of like moving around objects, but then also just being able to touch. And since in a lot of artistic places, touch isn't always a part of the exhibition and the viewer or audience member isn't able to interact with the material in that way. But what we're doing here with first our multi-sensorial activity at the beginning, and then a lot of our projects now have tactile elements that I think bridges some sort of gap. Then also we're having a larger discussion and we're having a group discussion that incorporates our thoughts, like all of our own thoughts, but then also thoughts to a wider public and that's being broadcast and shared. And yeah, although that's, it's not like what will last forever, it's still a, an opening up of thoughts and how we can look to make things very collaborative in the future. Mm -hmm. 
Um, speaking more directly to my to my project, I think um, compost is something that lends itself really well to collaboration, and I would say doesn't lend itself terribly well to be doing it completely on your own, just because it it feeds to an extent on volume and variety of feedstocks and um, Typically, when people compost together, people compost better, and I and I think that's why, that's why, um, you know, I, I mean, municipal composting exists for this reason, and um, because it, it, it's hard to be done individually, I think also to um, there are a lot of really great examples of people collaborating to do some pretty meaningful stuff with compost. There's one project at FIT that I did a fair bit of research on, where um, it, it, a pretty humongous team of people, I think it's a team of like. 12 people now um who who manage it almost full time as part of a as part of i think for the most part a phd um but they they take all the fabric scraps from all the labs around fit and those fabric scraps are composted and then that compost um is then used to grow dye plants like like eco dyeing plants on the roof of fit and i think that's a pretty good a pretty good um indicator that like compost projects are scalable and collaboration on compost projects can be really, really productive. And it is something that I want to explore in the future. Mm -hmm. And yeah, Arnold, for instance, do you plan on like collaborating with fashion designer or a small? Uh... Yes, yes. Okay. Uh, Good I answer. No. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, yes, I, I, well, I, I talk a lot more with people like a small kind of independent designer, which I already knew and more obvious, but now I'd like to collaborate with more like uh, established fashion designer mm -hmm. and also uh, with people who know more about user experience. So like creating a better user experience for the application and a better user interface as well, because that's not something I'm really knowledgeable in. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think it's hard to accept that you need people to help you and that you can do everything on your own. I think that's a big thing I had to realize uh, yeah. during my my journey. Mm -hmm. And uh, but yeah, we'll definitely uh, collaborate with more people from different fields. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and maybe we will conclude soon. But I will, I'm just curious: is there one last question from the the audience? Anyone has a burning question to ask the group? <laughs> no. Okay. So I think we'll we'll uh, we'll conclude this for today. Uh, I'd like to congratulate each and every one of you and and your group collectively for this. Uh, Beautiful presentation, exhibition, discussion. Uh, you know, you, you've put the, kind of assembled five keywords together. Uh, question of like uh, cherish, transition, attune, divert, matter. And it's very, these are not just words. These are principles that are embedded uh, within your practices in terms of uh, storytelling, in terms of process, in terms of making, in terms of communicating, in terms of uh, working together. So it's, uh, it's extremely interesting to see those words, not just as guiding principles, but as embodied ethical principles within your work. So congratulations. And we invite everyone to come back uh, tomorrow for session two of Critical Materiality 2023. So Just before we officially close up, I believe someone from your team wanted to introduce a final activity. No. I, I think we're moving on from that. No problem. <laughs> so yeah. thank you everyone for coming to Forest Space today for this beautiful exhibition and the conversation that followed. We're going to be closing up the Zoom, the live stream, the cameras now. But just a quick reminder that this conversation is already available on the YouTube channel if you'd like to revisit or share it. So thank you again, everyone. Feel free to roam around the space and enjoy the rest of the exhibition. Have a great afternoon. It's like a, you know, when you... Thank <laughs> you.